I'm Duncan Pelly. I'm an associate professor of entrepreneurship, and I was asked one of the hardest questions that you can ask a professor of entrepreneurship for this keynote, and that is, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? And let's think about why it's so hard to answer this question. If you ask people on the street, <clears throat> who are some famous entrepreneurs? They all say Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Steve Jobs. These are the people that we think of. And yet, if you compare their experiences to those of the average entrepreneur, it is so far removed from the average entrepreneurial experience, it might as well be fiction. So is this really what entrepreneurship is? The quick answer is that we don't exactly have a universally agreed upon definition of entrepreneurship. It just doesn't exist. Everyone will agree that entrepreneurship has some sort of a relationship to opportunity, but we don't agree on what that relationship is, and we don't agree on what an opportunity is. So what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 15 to 20 minutes is look at some definitions of entrepreneurship, kind of compare them. We'll look at some definitions of opportunity, and then I'll talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial mindset, and then finally, what are some examples of success for entrepreneurs. So the best way for me to describe what is entrepreneurship is maybe give some examples of the subtypes of entrepreneurship. And that can, through these examples, maybe you can get uh, an understanding of the macro level. So the stereotypical type of entrepreneur is what we call ex nihilo entrepreneurship. That's fancy Latin. It just means out of nothing. And we've all heard of these kinds of people. These are almost like inventors. They come up with some wild idea that it, it's like it came out of thin air. You're like, whoa, where did they come up with that idea? That's your ex nihilo entrepreneur. Who are some famous examples of this? Thomas Edison, the guy who invented the light bulb, right? Where did he come up with that idea for the light bulb? It just came out of, it almost came out of new, um, out of nothing, out of thin air. So you have ex nihilo. You have one of my favorites. Corporate entrepreneurship. Corporate entrepreneurship can be defined as what you might call entrepreneurship. You probably have heard this talked about in the media. Entrepreneurship is when an established firm launches a new product line, a new strategic business unit, or a new idea. So a little, it's like an entrepreneurial enterprise within the context of a larger firm. All right? But corporate entrepreneurship can also be when the corporation itself acts as the entrepreneur. So not a person as an entrepreneur, but the whole corporation. That corporation, for example, can change the rules of the competitive landscape. Think of how Facebook changed the competitive landscape of social media. Before Facebook came along, you know, there was MySpace, Friendster, but social media wasn't really a thing. So the act of totally changing that landscape made the company Facebook the entrepreneur. Or it could be when a firm launches some sort of a initiative for renewal. Think of Nokia, right? The Finnish uh, uh, company that made te uh, telephones, cell phones. It used to be a paper products company and it completely changed into the technology sector. That's another example of corporate entrepreneurship. The counterpart to corporate entrepreneurship is what we call organizational entrepreneurship. And organizational entrepreneurship is when employees within a firm act entrepreneurially in spite of the firm. It's like when you're sitting at your desk and you're like, I've got a really good idea, but that doesn't really follow company policy. How about I go behind my boss's back and get this done anyhow, and it benefits the company in the long run. So it's employees being entrepreneurial in spite of the firm. And that's organizational. So corporate is usually top down, organizational is bottom up. You've also got what you hear quite famously, social entrepreneurship. And this is how I think of social entrepreneurship. There are needs out there. If a business does not provide those needs and government does not provide those needs, social entrepreneurs can step in and fill them. Okay? Let me give an example. One of my favorite organizations in the whole world is called Homeboy Industries. It was founded in Los Angeles by a Catholic priest named Father Boyle. What Father Boyle wanted to do was rehabilitate convicts and former gang members into productive citizens of society. Most businesses were not willing to train former criminals and gang members, and they weren't willing to take a chance on hiring them. So business was not helping out. 
government, the city of Los Angeles, the federal government, whatever, was also not willing to provide sufficient job training opportunities for these former inmates. Okay, so government didn't do it, businesses didn't do it. So Father Boyle used, initially, the resources of the Catholic Church to start a whole series of little businesses specifically so that they could employ former gang members. He started a bakery, for example, and Father Boyle always says, we don't hire homies, homies are the, the former gang members he's rehabilitating, we don't hire homies to bake bread. We bake bread to hire homies. In other words, the, everything that that business is doing is specifically to give these individuals a job, dignity. These are things that don't really have a market value, but they're definitely necessary. And so that's why we have social entrepreneurship. We also have Gaia entrepreneurship. That's a, that's a new type of entrepreneurship. And that is a form of entrepreneurship that focuses on sustainability with the earth. Again, it's like social entrepreneurship, but it has a distinct environmental focus. You have take entrepreneurship. These are the ones you normally think of now because of popular media. You think about Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. These are the people that are involved in the technology. They're doing the programming. They're doing the hardware and the software. They're doing all that cool, fancy stuff in Silicon Valley. You have serial entrepreneurs. A serial entrepreneur is somebody who engages in multiple different business lines throughout the course of their life. Stereotypically, a serial entrepreneur starts a business, they become really successful, they get bored with it, they sell it, and they start something else. Okay? I work with this one lady. She is the classic example of a serial entrepreneur. She started out, she ran a restaurant. She got bored with it, she sold it. She moved into property management. She got bored with that, she sold that. Then she had a trucking company. Got bored with that, she sold that. Then she owned a laundromat. Got bored with that, sold that. Went into consulting, got bored, sold that, and now she's back into trucking again. Very different industries, but you know, every time the business is kind of big, she gets bored kind of being a manager. She sells the business and starts over with something new. That's just kind of her personality. And this is a serial entrepreneur. You have lifestyle entrepreneurs. These are people that have hobbies, okay? And they usually try to find some way to monetize their hobby. There was a guy I used to work with, his name was Mark. His day job is he was a middle school science teacher. But his hobby, what he found relaxing, was that he made birdhouses. He just carved them out of wood and everything, and they're beautiful birdhouses. And so he'd make a birdhouse, but he never had anything to do with it, so he'd just throw it in his garage. Well, his garage got really full, and his wife started screaming at him, right? And she said, Mark, the birdhouses gotta go. So what does Mark start doing? He starts giving away his presents. You know, you go to someone's house for dinner, here's a birdhouse. And people start saying, Mark, can I buy some of these birdhouses? Well, Mark had never thought about that before. Um, but eventually he started selling them. And the demand for his birdhouses grew. People wanted the birdhouses. They wanted more of them, and he couldn't do it all by himself. So he eventually bought like an aircraft hangar, put it up in his backyard, and he started employing people to help him paint the roofs of the birdhouses or paint little features on them. And now he employs six people, all because he had this hobby of making birdhouses. So this is a lifestyle. A prosaic entrepreneur is somebody who uses routines at work as a way to facilitate a side business. Okay? I'll give an example. I am a professor. The nature of this job as a professor helps me do things like consulting, helps me have a YouTube channel, kind of gives me a solid basis to kind of do other things. And so it's built upon my workplace routines. That's a prosaic entrepreneur. We've also got the family entrepreneur. And you're probably very familiar with family entrepreneurs. Think about maybe mom and dad own a restaurant and they pass that business on to their child. Mom and dad own a dry cleaners, they pass that job on to their child. You know, it's a, it's a business that is entirely family run. And then my personal favorite is you have narrative entrepreneurs. And this doesn't even really have anything to do with organizational formation, right? Or running an organization. Narrative entrepreneurs are people that are some, in some way dissatisfied with a dominant narrative, a dominant story. They tell their own story that winds up countering that story. Let me give a couple of examples to illustrate. Think of Jesus. Okay? Jesus is somebody that told a powerful counter story to the dominant narratives of the world at the time. And this counter story created a religion that has lasted long after Jesus has died. So Jesus is not an entrepreneur because he was a businessman. 
but he's an entrepreneur because he told a counter story that's lasted. Martin Luther King is another good example of a narrative entrepreneur. Again, he had a counter story to the dominant narrative, and that changed the way people saw themselves in the world, okay? particularly conversations about racism. I would also argue that someone like Mark Zuckerberg is an example of a narrative entrepreneur. Not because he started Facebook per se, but because of what Facebook did. Okay? I think about when I was a, an undergraduate, what did you do in your spare time? You went to a bar and you talked to strangers, or maybe you watched a sports game or something. right? Now when you go to the bar, you look to the left and you look to the right, and what are people doing? Pecking away on their smartphones. They're not talking to anybody. So Facebook launched a social media craze, which fundamentally changed the way we communicate with each other. That's why this is narrative entrepreneurship. It changed the rules of communication. Okay. So I've shown you, you see, these are all very, very different types of entrepreneurship and very different understandings of entrepreneurship. But there must be some commonalities, right? There are. First of all, they all have some sort of an opportunity is some sort of an opportunity. Think about it. An opportunity to take over the family business. An opportunity to tell a counter story. An opportunity to create something new. An opportunity to, to be an entrepreneur within an organization. An entrepreneur to do something that has an ethical perspective on it, right? An opportunity to launch a new form of technology. An opportunity to have multiple businesses over the course of your lifetime. The opportunity to do something fun for yourself. So these are all the opportunities. So there, there are opportunities there. But what is not always the same between entrepreneurs is the relationship you have with the opportunity. And that gets us into two different ways of looking at opportunity. We have a causation perspective and an effectuation perspective. Causation basically means you know exactly what you want to do and you gather the resources to make that opportunity happen. Right? This is a very objectivist way of looking at things. And I'll give a couple of examples from these types of entrepreneurs. Right? Let's say you know you want to create an awesome video game and you know exactly what that video game looks like. Okay? You know. You write out a beautiful, elegant business plan. You present it to the bank or venture capitalists. They love it. They give you some money. You hire the people. You do everything. You gather all those means and all those resources to create that video game because you know exactly what you want. It's that video game. That's a causation mindset, okay? Or family. Causation, again, the opportunity is very much a discovery-based perspective, okay? You know exactly what you want to do. I want to take over the family dry cleaning business, and I know these are the steps that I need to take to get there, okay? I'll give one more example, because hopefully this makes sense. Father Boyle, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to reduce crime, and give gang members in Los Angeles County a chance to live a life of dignity and respect. And he knew he needed to do that through job creation. That was the overarching goal. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. And he started a series of organizations to support that goal. Okay? Causation. Effectuation is completely the opposite. You say, I know kind of my skill sets. I know what resources I have. I know my network. I don't exactly know what I want to do with it, though, right? So let's give an example of serial entrepreneurship and effectuation, right? Okay, I've got some money in the bank. Um, I've got a buddy who's a truck driver. Um, I've got some time to spend. I wonder what I could do with it. Well, what if I bought a truck for my buddy who's a truck driver and we had a small trucking business? Because you start off, you don't really know what you want to do. I want to make money. I want to be happy. Um, I want to have fun. It's some sort of a very generalized aspiration. And you kind of improvise. And so maybe the trucking thing, it doesn't work out. Again, I'm using the example of uh, the lady I mentioned earlier. It's like, all right, well, I do know how to run a business. Um, I've got some money in the bank left over from trucking. Um, yeah, you know what? That same buddy, he's not trucking anymore, and he's got some friends. I wonder what we could do. Hmm, and you're kind of looking around. Looking, oh, there's a laundromat that's for sale. All right, let me, let me buy that laundromat, and now we have a laundromat business, using the money, the friends, et cetera, to kind of start that business, right? So it's very much kind of improvising, flying by the seat of your pants. In other words, you are creating opportunities. 
Do you want to use examples from pop culture? My favorite causation-based entrepreneur is MacGyver from that television show, right? He knew if he didn't get out of a building, oh, you know, he'd die or something like that, and he'd take just different things that were nearby, and he'd find some way to get out of a building or fire or whatever. An effectuation is very much like the famous artist Bob Ross, who had a television show. Bob Ross always started with a blank canvas, and he never really knew what he was going to paint. He would just kind of start painting, and the picture would kind of manifest itself as he went. Okay? So these are also very different kinds of entrepreneurs. Right? You've got kind of the, the specific settings in which you can be an entrepreneur, and then you've almost got kind of the ethical perspective. Right? I'm going to go out there and take something that's out there in the environment, or I'm going to make something totally new. Right? Causation versus effectuation. Now, once again, what do all these things have in common? Right? All of these entrepreneurs, whether it's causation or effectuation-based or any of these particular types of entrepreneurs, they are people that are tolerant of ambiguity. They understand ambiguity. Now, our causation friends, you know, they find ways to control risk. Our effectuation friends thrive in uncertainty. Right? But it's still ambiguity. Um, these are people who are not managers. You know, the managerial type, you can take a checklist, did you do these things, yes or no. But, you know, entrepreneurs, they're kind of like swimming in a pool, a dark pool, or swimming in the ocean at night. You can't always see where you're going, you don't always know what you're doing, but that's the environment in which you thrive. Okay? So they all have a high tolerance of ambiguity. And so what I say, this tolerance of ambiguity leads to what we call the plus zone challenge. And this is how you should be learning entrepreneurship. And you engage in two different processes. The first is self-critique, which very much corresponds to an effectuation mindset. Now, you've got to have effectuation and causation, and you've got to have self-critique and subject critique at the same time. But it's just it's more of a percentage. You know, 40% effectuation, 60% causation, 40% self-critique, 60% subject critique. Right? But think about this. The person who's going to be a manager, and there's nothing wrong with being a manager, by the way. But the person who's going to be a manager, they go to school, they read a book, they watch a YouTube video, they learn the material, and they regurgitate it. Okay? Do you know how to do a business plan? Yes or no? Okay? I did the business plan. Yeah, I know all the steps. I'm all done. I'm ready to go. And I can do that same process of making a business plan over and over and over. Okay? But if you teach an entrepreneur self-critique, they say this. They say, well, you know what? Is this way of doing a business plan, is it ethical? Does it make sense to me? Right? What am I thinking about? Okay. So you start saying, what does this actually mean for me? Okay. Those that engage in what we call subject critique have a similar set of questions. They say, does this actually make sense, yes or no? Is this ethical? When you engage in subject critique, it's not a matter of reading the book and mastering all the concepts. It's a matter of cannibalizing the ideas, taking what's relevant to you, eating it up, and making the necessary connections in some sort of a new way. This is the essence of subject critique. right? So whenever you're learning entrepreneurship, you've got to say, how is this useful for me? And how can I utilize this knowledge in maybe a way in which it wasn't intended? But either way, these both involve very serious ethical questions. Right? And based on your own ethical stance, you know, there's 18 different ethical principles that I've counted so far, but based on how you look at this ethical perspective, that leads you to a, another important question. And that is, what does it mean to be successful as an entrepreneur? Right? And there's no definition of entrepreneurial success. None. Okay? Being successful as an entrepreneur could mean making a lot of money. Okay? That's a common one. But that's not the most common one. In fact, most entrepreneurs go into business for themselves, not because they're making money. Because let's face it, most of the time you can make more money and have less stress just being a manager somewhere. right? Entrepreneurship is not always the path to the most money. But they do it because it supports some sort of a life goal. right? Maybe you want to work at home more so you can spend more time with your family. That's a good reason to go into business. right? Maybe you want to be a social entrepreneur and there's just no way to do that social good, that important thing you want to do for society, if you're a manager. That's another reason to go into business for yourself. Okay? Alternatively, um, maybe you want to go into entrepreneurship because you're mad. 
you want to you want to prove something to someone. I can do it. You said no, but you know what? I can do it. So there's that kind of motivation that you want to do it yourself. Or you've got this wild and crazy invention, and the only way you can make that invention happen is by going into business for yourself. So what we've talked about in this particular discussion is we've addressed there's so many different ways to be an entrepreneur. There's no universal way of accepting it. There's many different ways to seize or exploit or to create or enhance opportunities. So we don't exactly know what entrepreneurship is. We don't exactly know what opportunity is. So there's a lot of ambiguity we've got to encounter. But, and we also don't know what success is, but the way to think about being an entrepreneur is to think about what all of these things mean for you. Right? There's no universal path to entrepreneurship, no universal path to success, no universal path to an opportunity. So what it's, it's contingent upon you, the future entrepreneur, to decide how to use any knowledge you acquire to match whatever your own personal goals are. Again, make it your own. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Um, as always, give me a likes if you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you comment down below if you have any questions, and I definitely would appreciate any subscriptions you can offer. Great.